Hello everyone, welcome back to another reaction video. Today we are going back to Epic History TV again and catching up on the latest in the Napoleonic War series. They have filled in the gap by covering the Battle of Eylau 1807. So that's what we'll do today. So without further ado, let's get going. January 1807. French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, victor of Ulm, Austerlitz and Jena, was near the height of his powers. Yes, Ulm, Austerlitz and Jena are three of his most crushing victories over the coalition forces. And he is close to getting the peace deal at Tilsit done. Uh, but he's not there yet. The Russians are not yet beaten. The Prussians certainly are. And uh, he's about to reach the height of his power. But the Battle of Eylau is a worrying sign of things to come, as we will see. His Grande Armée had swept all before it. Now, in the depths of a bitter Polish winter, he sought the final victory that would make him master of Europe. His target, the Russians supported by the remains of the Prussian army. But many months of campaigning had exhausted even his toughest veterans. Most had not seen France in years, and the war in Poland seemed to offer only freezing mud, hunger, and a stubborn enemy who did not know when he was beaten. Yes, the situation for the French army in Poland is anything but good. Um, during this time, there may have been recorded as many cases as 100 suicides. And the fact is, the weather conditions are such that uh, the army cannot move very fast. They are often soaked in mud. Much of the army is out scouring for food. As much as 40% of Napoleon's army uh, during this winter was out foraging for food in a country or in an area that uh, could hardly support its own population during a peacetime, let alone two large armies. And so uh, it even gave rise to some dark humor. The army had a joke, the French army had a joke that went something like this, that the Polish language could be summarized in a few words. Bread? There is none. Water? Immediately. And uh, that sort of says everything about the situation here. Uh, even one time there was a uh, French infantry column marching on the muddy Polish roads when Napoleon passed by. And one of the soldiers uh, cried out to Napoleon, Bread? And uh, Napoleon responded, there is none. And then <laughs> there was apparently a great amount of laughter. And that sort of uh, anecdote is uh, typical of uh, Napoleon, really. It shows how close he is to his men, despite the desperate situation they are in. And uh, yeah, but the situation is bad and it's going to get worse. At Poltusk, the Russians had fought courageously and thwarted Napoleon's first attempt to outmaneuver their army. Yeah, um, Bennigsen conducted a um, good rearguard action at Potusk. He was attacked by Marshal Lann. And uh, if you know anything about Marshal Lann, is that he's very good at what he does. But uh, Lann was outnumbered. Uh, he was down maybe 10,000 men compared to the Russians. And... Uh, Fighting a rear guard, you would ideally have more men attacking. So, and yeah, and the attack was conducted during a snowstorm, so, you know, conditions weren't ideal for Lan. But uh, at that time, Bennigsen managed to hold off the French attack, and Napoleon's uh, plans to destroy the Russians before going into winter quarters uh, fell apart. But another opportunity would soon emerge. Command of the Russian army had recently passed to General Levin August von Bennigsen, 
despite his German name and Hanoverian roots, he was a veteran of 34 years' service with the Imperial Russian Army. Yes, uh, Bennigsen was a distinguished general within the Russian Imperial Army and had fought for many decades in various wars on behalf of Russia. And it was not at all unusual uh, at this time for Germans to be serving in uh, the Russian army. Uh, Russia at this time is one of those Germanophone countries. Uh, they loved the Germans. And so much so that uh, it's very common. Uh, you know, really, the, Rus the Russian Imperial dynasty is uh, uh, filled with Germans at this point. Uh, many a German, uh, for example, uh, the Empress, uh, the Empress Catherine, Catherine the Great. She was originally German, for example, and uh, many a spouse to a Tsar had been German, and many generals are German, <laughs> and so you can see how uh, a pattern is going here, and. Uh, this is a trend that uh, will continue for a while until uh, basically when the Romanovs fell and then the, you know, the new Soviet party was not that fond of the Germans. One great sign of the German influence on uh, Russia is the name of uh, St. Petersburg. It sounds very German. And uh, it was renamed to Leningrad to remove any connotations to Germany during World War I or after it. So, yeah, there's that. That's just a side tangent, though. On the 27th of January, with 77,000 Russians and 13,000 Prussians, Bennigsen launched a surprise winter offensive, targeting Marshal Ney's exposed 6th Corps. Now, Ney was not actually supposed to be at Heilsburg. He had specific orders not to go in that direction by Napoleon. However, uh, like everyone else, his supply situation was pretty desperate. And we, he was hoping to capture a major supply depot to the city of Königsberg. And uh, he knew that if he succeeded in doing so, Napoleon would have condoned such an action, and that's very typical. Uh, Napoleon may give orders, but if you show initiative and succeed, Napoleon will praise you. If you fail, however, which is sort of what happened here with Ney, you will hear the fury of Napoleon, who did not like when people deviated from his orders. And it looked to Napoleon that Ney's action here, uh, taking Heilsberg, provoked Bennigsen's winter offensive. Now, Bennigsen had planned this winter offensive, um, to do this winter offensive regardless, so, you know. Uh, but uh, that's just how it goes. Sometimes things don't work out as you hope. But Ney escaped, and Bernadotte's first corps fought a successful rearguard action at Morongen. Yeah, obviously Bernadotte did not face the entire Russian army. He faced the advance guard. It was a pretty sizable advance guard. But uh, Bernadotte was able to extricate himself from this particular engagement. And with rearguard actions, you only need to delay the enemy so that the rest of the army can get away. Now Napoleon would turn the tables on Bennigsen. As soon as he'd learned of the Russian advance, he'd begun planning a grand encirclement of the enemy. This is a very typical Napoleon move, really. This is what he loves to do, it's what he's been doing this entire time. And Napoleon's ideal scenario would be to uh, come around Benigsen's flank and take him in the rear and cut him off from his escape. And failing that, to hit him in the flank and uh, fix him into position. And it was a good plan on paper. However, the problem for Napoleon is that the weather is really bad. And his army can only march about 7 miles per day, which is really slow for Napoleon and his Grande Armée. They usually move much further per day. And uh, 
unfortunately for Napoleon, uh, Benningsen will capture some uh, dispatches to Marshal Bernadotte containing um, the entire disposition and plan of his Grand Armée. So Benningsen will find out about this trap and manage to retreat. Suddenly, it was the Russians who were exposed. But Benningsen got wind of Napoleon's trap just in time and began a hurried withdrawal. So what does Napoleon want to do now? Uh, he hasn't yet realized that Benningsen has found out, but what he will decide to do is to try to catch up to him and fix him into position so he can get a decisive battle. Five days of relentless marching followed, with Marshal Murat's vanguard nipping at the Russians' heels all the way. But despite a series of furious assaults on their rear guard, ably commanded by Prince Bagration, the French could not break through. Yeah, the Battle of Hof is uh, one of those rear guard actions, and uh, the French were able to win by a charge by General Daupoul's uh, cuirassiers. They managed to charge the Russian gunnery position and uh, Napoleon praised him for it. And uh, well, Daupoul was also very happy and he told his men that uh, since the Emperor was so pleased with their efforts he could kiss all their asses. <laughs> now, all, with always with historical quotes and stuff you gotta take things uh, uh, with a bit of grain of salt, but I would like to believe he said something like that. Uh, that sounds like something um, ma many of these characters during the Napoleonic Wars would say. <laughs> the pursuit continued, even as temperatures plummeted. To the north, Ney shadowed Lestock's Prussian Corps while Soult's 4th Corps followed the Russian rearguard to the small East Prussian town of Eilau. On the afternoon of the 7th of February, Marshal Soult's troops advanced up the icy road to Eilau. They found it held by General Barclay de Tolly's Russian division. Barclay de Tolly is, of course, uh, one of the most preeminent Russian generals during the Napoleonic Wars. I would say he is among the best generals, uh, Russian generals, perhaps the best. It's kind of hard to make that determination. Uh, Barclay, of course, is the mastermind behind the 1812 uh, defensive plan for Russia which turned out to work quite brilliantly, even though uh, they had a lot of problems along the way. And uh, we got both Barclay, Bagration and Benningsen, so it's uh, quite a stacked Russian leadership team here. Entrenched along a line of fences, ditches and barricades. Just before dusk, confused combat began around the town cemetery. Yeah, and there have been many explanations uh, for this action. Now, Napoleon did not want to start the battle uh, at this time. He wanted to wait until Ney and uh, Davou could join him before beginning the combat. Um, now, there, like I said, there have been many explanations for what happened here. Um, Marshal Soult's explanation is probably the best one, and that is... Uh, his explanation was that some of the reserve cavalry had followed the Russians into Eilau here and uh, an infantry uh, regiment, the 24th Lion Infantry Regiment, had followed the cavalry into Eilau and that started the combat basically. And from then onwards it was just like a snowball, more and more and more men were sucked into the fighting and uh, those sort of hap those sorts of uh, accidents are quite common in history. Actually, we've seen this even in ancient history, where you know a small skirmish develops into a full-scale battle. More 
moment more troops were sucked into the bitter fighting. The French took the cemetery with a bayonet charge, but then had to hold it against a determined Russian counterattack, led by Barclay himself, who was seriously wounded by grape shot. Yeah, you have to get pretty close to get hit by grape shot. So, you know, all credit to Barclay for being on the front lines with his men. I always respect and admire generals who actually uh, are with the men on the front lines. Uh, but regardless, uh, this action really um, seriously wounded Barclay, as he said. And he would be out of action for about 15 months. Which tells you the severity of his uh, wounds. So uh, getting hit by grape shot was no joke, and surviving it is no joke either. That's pretty impressive. Vicious street fighting continued well into the night, but the French ultimately prevailed, with the loss of four thousand casualties on each side. Yeah. So Benningsen. Um, had ordered Bagration to retake Eilau, um, and then there was vicious street fighting, but eventually Benningsen changed his mind and ordered Bagration to retreat. Soldiers and officers alike were astonished by the savagery of the engagement. As darkness fell, temperatures dropped dramatically. Many of the wounded froze to death where they had fallen. The French ransacked Eilau for food and firewood. Many Russian soldiers had to sleep in open fields, wrapped only in their greatcoats, forbidden to light fires. Yeah, the situation for both armies are quite terrible, as we've already established. Um, you know, um, the lack of bread and other food meant that uh, soldiers were forced to eat um, horse meat and uh, drink horse blood. And that's how bad it was. And of course, it's cold as hell. And those who are wounded, they have no chance. That night, Napoleon's greatest concern was that the Russians would slip away under cover of darkness robbing him of the decisive battle he craved. This is very reminiscent of what would happen during the 1812 campaign. Um, the reason Napoleon, like he would do at Eilau, uh, to opt for a frontal assault rather than some tactical flare maneuver, uh, well, the reason is he was always afraid the Russians was going to retreat. At Eilau he was afraid they were going to retreat. At Bordino he was afraid they were going to retreat. So he would opt for a frontal attack to pin them in place and uh, allow, well, in this case, uh, Davout's corps to batter him from the, uh, from the flank. He need not have worried. Benningsen was done running. Here, at Eilau, the Russians would make their stand. Exactly what they would do at Borodino. Yeah, so I might be wrong about this, but I do believe the Battle of Eilau is the first two-day engagement Napoleon has fought since the Battle of Arcole in 1796. So yeah, the battles are going to become longer and longer. Um, two-day, three-day, even four-day engagements are going to become very commonplace during uh, the latter half of the Napoleonic Wars. It was a vast hurricane of death that seemed to smash and erase from the face of the earth everything in its path. Denis Davidov, Le Lieutenant uh, Lifeguard Hussars. Yeah, that's a pretty horrifying description. Before dawn, Napoleon was on Eilau's cemetery knoll, trying to make out the Russian lines through his telescope. 
he was surprised by what he saw. 67,000 Russians packed into two great lines along a three-mile front, with well-defended villages anchoring both flanks. Open ground lay between the two armies, providing a clear field of fire for Bennigsen's 400 guns, a huge amount of artillery. Yeah, um, 400 guns for an army of 67,000 men. The artillery to and the artillery to um, soldier ratio here is outrageous, really. Uh, the, it was not normal for an army of this size to have so many guns. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty bad. <laughs> uh, especially if you have open fields. It's going to be very hard, even for Russian gunners, who were not that great at this point in the war to miss for an army of the age. Napoleon had Soult and Augereau's depleted corps, plus the Imperial Guard and Murat's reserve cavalry. Yeah, that's not a lot of troops, and uh, this is because Napoleon had uh, hurried along their, his uh, troops in order to catch the Russians and fix them into position. And so some units have been left behind, such as uh, Davu and Ney, who are not in place yet. Just 45,000 men and 137 guns. But Napoleon was expecting Davu's third corps, 15,000 men, to arrive at any moment, in perfect position to fall on the Russian flank. At dawn, as French troops were still getting into position, Hundreds of Russian guns opened a massive bombardment. In Eilau, there was chaos as round shot crashed through buildings and tore through men. French guns soon answered the Russians in kind. It was the largest combined artillery bombardment the world had yet seen. It lasted nearly three hours. Yeah, I have uh, never managed to understand how these men could stand there in rigid formation and watch as these round shots just tore through their ranks. And they didn't waver, uh, they didn't run. I don't understand these men, they, they, they were made of different stuff back then. While Bennigsen had quantity, French crews were more experienced and against the densely packed Russian lines, they couldn't miss. Meanwhile, Davout's two leading divisions arrived on the battlefield, dangerously placed on the Russian left flank. But before they could attack, Prince Galitsyn struck first with his cavalry brigade. Uh, Prince Galitsyn actually fought a um, very good rearguard action, for which Napoleon actually praised him when they met at the peace conference at Tilsit. Just a little bit of trivia here. Davout's veterans threw back the horsemen with disciplined fire. Galitsyn's charge, however, bought time for General Bagavut to reorganize his defensive line to face the new threat. General Bagavut, as I recall, he was also present at the Battle of Borodino. Now, come to think of it, Bennigsen is practically the only one who wasn't there at this point. Uh, but yes, when you have a village, you can really anchor it and make it a fortress. And you would see the same sort of thing done during the Battle of Leipzig, for example. Napoleon made all of these small Saxon villages into uh, fortresses, and it was very, very difficult to take them. When the Iron Marshal attacked around 8 a.m., he found the enemy entrenched on a ridge with formidable artillery support. Davout's lead division was mauled, suffering 1,500 casualties as it was thrown back. This check on Davout alarmed Napoleon. He feared the Russians might withdraw before his trap could close. 
It was, he decided, the battle's critical moment. Orders flew out to Marshal Augereau's 7th Corps and General saint Hilaire's division. Yeah, this is one of Napoleon's greatest strengths, recognizing the critical moment in a battle and quickly issuing a flurry of orders to take advantage of it. Uh, even though it would not always work out, of course, as I'm afraid the case will be here. They were to launch a frontal attack against the enemy. At all costs, the Russians' escape must be prevented. All was disorder, confusion, stupor under an avalanche of blows. French staff officer of Marshal Augereau's corps. The 49-year-old Marshal Augereau had been with Napoleon since his first command in Italy and the brilliant campaign of 96. But he was deeply unwell that morning. At 10 a.m., strapped to his horse, he led forward the 12,000 troops of 7th Corps. Yeah, Marshal Augereau was seriously sick uh, during this battle. He was strapped to his horse and he even had to have an aide-de-camp uh, hold him up to make sure he didn't fall off his horse anyways. So he, he was not in an ideal condition. Um, now, I don't think even if Marshal Augereau had been uh, young and fresh, so to speak, he couldn't have prevented this disaster from unfolding. Just as heavy snow began to fall. With visibility down to a few feet, Augereau's divisions drifted off course. Yeah, and in the space between these two armies, there's a bunch of slopes and folds. And so you could easily see how in a snowstorm, you could easily get completely disoriented. And the only clue that uh, Augereau's men had was the muzzle flashes from the cannons. Straight into the murderous artillery duel. French and Russian cannonballs tore through their ranks. Yikes! Augereau's men pushed on doggedly. But as they neared the Russian line, the blizzard suddenly lifted. One division found itself facing 70 Russian guns at a range of just 30 yards. Disaster. Seconds later, its forward ranks were obliterated by Russian canister. Another French division broke through the enemy line, only to be surrounded on three sides by Russian bayonets and annihilated. Augereau's horse was killed under him, Oof. leaving him badly injured. As the survivors of his corps stumbled back the way they'd come, Russian cavalry and infantry surged forward. Units were overrun, entire regiments swallowed up, order and discipline collapsed. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure exactly when, but at some point during this battle, a Russian infantry um, regiment made its way towards the church where Napoleon had his lookout. And it was very close that Napoleon was captured. <laughs> and uh, he was also exposed in the church tower, you know, um, all the cannonballs and the flying around. Yeah, so Napoleon was not in a, the safest position here. But it was the best position for him to have a complete overview of the battlefield. And yes, uh, Ogiro's disaster... It is what it is. I don't think there's anything that can be done. It was just a bunch of bad luck. One of the few units to maintain order was the 14th Infantry, nicknamed the Brave for its heroic role at Rivoli ten years before. But now they were outnumbered and surrounded. The regiment resisted bravely, but was cut to pieces, suffering 75% casualties and the loss of its Eagle standard. Yeah, that's very unfortunate. Uh... The 14th is a veteran line regiment at this point, and them losing so many men is just very unfortunate. Uh, many of Napoleon's best veterans are lost at Eilau. And uh, yeah, 
like I said, it's a sign of things to come with these enormous casualty rates. And uh, that is due to many reasons, uh, partly because the armies are getting bigger and bigger. But for Eilau, uh, the outrageous amount of artillery around is the main cause of all of these casualties. And uh, well, credit to the 14th uh, Regiment here, standing firm despite the odds, but it was all in vain, I'm afraid. In the space of just 30 minutes, the Russians inflicted 5,000 casualties on Augereau's 7th Corps. Effectively, it had ceased to exist. It was one of the worst battlefield disasters of the Napoleonic Wars. For the French, Eilau was no longer a fight for victory, but a struggle for survival. Are you going to let those fellows devour us? Famous quote by Napoleon to Mueller here. From Eilau's cemetery knoll, Napoleon watched the catastrophe engulfing Augereau's corps. He knew he must stabilize the situation immediately and buy time to reorganize his center and for Davout's corps to arrive in force. Yes, um, this is a desperate gamble by Napoleon, make no mistake about it. But can we talk about Mura's dress? He wore some uh, green Polish cloak or green Polish cap during this battle. He was always dressed uh, so extravagantly, and uh, even in you know what, during the invasion of Russia, he always had ill-fitting uh, clothes that were not uh, that great for winter conditions. But you know somehow <laughs> he always had to be dressed like this. But uh, yes, back to the great charge of Eilau. This is one of the most epic moments during the entire war and uh, it will be remembered as one of the great cavalry charges of history so the emperor turned to mura and his large cavalry reserve it was a desperate gamble the horses were tired and suffering from the cold they'd be outnumbered and unsupported by infantry But the flamboyant, apparently fearless Marshal Murat was undaunted. He assembled 40 squadrons of cavalry, 5,000 dragoons and cuirassiers. This uh, painting here is one of my favorite ones of the Napoleonic Wars. It really shows you how many horsemen were involved in this charge. Now I've heard other numbers than 5,000. I've heard as much as 12,000. I'm sure the truth is somewhere in between, and depending on how you count. Um, but regardless, it was, it was a major, major charge. Uh, the numbers I've seen is 7,300 Dragoons, 1,900 Cuirassiers, 1,500 Guard, uh, guard Cavalry. So something like that. Uh, but regardless, it was... Uh, it was crazy. It was a crazy move. <laughs> and led them forward. Crazy and desperate. So began one of the legendary cavalry charges of the Napoleonic Wars. Unable to move much faster than a walk due to the terrible conditions, Murat's cavalry nevertheless presented a formidable wall of men, horses and steel. General Grouchy's dragoons, in the lead, drove back the advancing Russians. Dudpool's steel-clad cuirassiers then thundered forward on their giant horses. Finding a gap between two Russian divisions, they used it to pry open the enemy line. With seemingly unstoppable momentum, the riders surged forward. But it could not last. As they neared Bennigsen's headquarters, a Russian battery blasted the French horsemen with canister. Yeah. 
Doubtpool himself was mortally wounded. Yeah, Doubtpool was a very good cavalry general, and it's an unfortunate loss for Napoleon, of course. Uh, he was well liked by Napoleon, and it took him actually several days to finally succumb to his injuries. So uh, I'm sure it must have been an agonizing uh, time for him. French momentum was lost. As the Russian counterattack began, Murat ordered his squadrons to regroup and pull back. He almost didn't make it. The Russian 4th Division had moved to block his escape. Seeing this, Napoleon ordered Marshal Bessières to lead forward the Guard cavalry. Yeah. Napoleon does not use the guard very often, only in the most desperate of circumstances does the guard be sent into action. And the guard cavalry is even more rare um, to see them appear on the battlefield. So um, yeah, it says a lot about the situation Napoleon is in. But the guard cavalry is a very potent reserve force as we will see. These were 2,000 of the finest cavalry in Europe. And to cheers of Vive l'Empereur, they advanced into the whirling mass of shot and snow. When Colonel Le Pique saw his men ducking, he called out, Heads up, by God! Those are bullets, not turds. <laughs> Yes, uh, Colonel Le Pic, uh, was actually rewarded for his bravery by Napoleon uh, during this battle. He um, received 50,000 francs. Not bad for a day's work. Chasseurs of the guard charged down the first Russian infantry square they what met. What a sight it must be. Scattered the enemy's gunners and cut out a path for Murat's retreating squadrons. The French charge at Eylau would go down as one of the boldest, most desperate military maneuvers of the age. The losses were terrible in men and horses. Yeah, it's estimated that Napoleon lost about 2,000 cavalry during this uh, charge, which was a whole lot of cavalry lost. Cavalrymen were much harder to replace than infantry, because the extensive training required for a horseman. And the cavalry was much smaller than the infantry arm. So as a percentage, 2000 was a significant amount. But it accomplished its task and saved Napoleon from utter destruction. So, you know, it was worth it in the end. But it succeeded in its mission. The Russian advance had been stopped in its tracks. And the initiative had swung back to Napoleon. All attention on both sides was now riveted on Davu and our left wing. The situation did not appear very rosy. Denis Davidon. Nope. Marshal Davu's third corps, the famed heroes of Auerstedt four months before, had now arrived in sufficient force to launch a full-scale assault. Anticipating this, Bagovut withdrew to a new defensive line on the Kriegerberger, a dominating height perfect Yeah, that's for a nasty defensive position. Two hours of chaotic fighting followed, with every French advance challenged by a fierce Russian counterattack. But supported by Dragoons and Saint-Hilaire's division, 3rd Corps slowly ground down the enemy. Benningson was forced to send in his last reserve, Kaminsky's 14th Division. Supported by cavalry, it drove the French from Klein Sausgarten and across the fields beyond until its own advance was checked by French artillery. When Davu resumed his attack at 3 pm, the Russian line buckled. The Kriegerberger was taken. So too, Benningson's headquarters at Alklappen. Benningson scraped together enough units to improvise a new defensive line. But French guns, hauled up to the Kriegerberger, opened up a devastating fire. 
And this is just pure chaos and carnage at this point. And uh, Bennington, to his credit, is doing a fairly good job in maintaining um, discipline and ensuring that there's no rout at this point. The French pressure was irresistible. The Russian flank would surely collapse at any moment, handing Napoleon the decisive victory he so desperately sought. Now one could ask, why does not Napoleon take this opportunity to advance? Well, there's still too many goddamn cannons um, in front of them. And uh, so any, any advance would be checked by Russian artillery. All that was required was one final push. Good God, the Prussians are here too. That's what they said at Waterloo. Early that morning, Bennigsen had sent urgent orders to Prussian General Anton von Listock to join the main army with his corps as quickly as possible. Although nearly 70, Listock was still as energetic as he'd been serving under Frederick the Great, and was assisted by a highly capable chief of staff, Colonel Gerhard von Scharnhorst. Scharnhorst is one of the most important and forgotten figures of the Napoleonic Wars, frankly. Scharnhorst is one of the men who will lead the uh, major reformation of the Prussian army, especially after uh, the loss. Losses Russia's incurred at the peace conference at Tilsit, Scharnhorst uh, would initiate a major uh, program to overhaul, completely overhaul, the Prussian army, so that when they next faced Napoleon, they were ready. Also had a battleship uh, named after him during World War II, so there, there. Um, so there's that. Lestock's corps, 9,000 men, was eight miles northwest of Eylau, closely watched by Marshal Ney's 6th Corps. His orders were to prevent the Prussians linking up with the Russians at all costs. Now, uh, Napoleon had called for uh, Ney's to join him on the battlefield too late. Um, this is because apparently Mura had erroneously reported a Russian retreat in the morning. And uh, so Napoleon didn't call on Ney until 8 a.m. on the 8th of that month. And so Ney would not arrive really in time to do anything in the Battle of Eylau. But by force marching his troops along frozen, hilly country roads, Lestock was able to bypass Ney's blocking force. To Bennigsen's joy, by early afternoon, the Prussians had reached Schmoditen. With his left flank crumbling, there was no time to lose. At 4 p.m., Lestock's Prussians charged forward. By now, Davout's men had been marching and fighting for many hours, and were utterly spent. They managed a few ragged volleys before they turned and ran. Russian cavalry followed in pursuit. Marshal Davout, with just one intact division left, prepared to make a stand on the Kriegerberger. The brave, he shouted, will find a glorious death here. Fortunately for Davout, the enemy's attacks were poorly coordinated, and his 40-gun battery inflicted terrible losses. Around 5.30, as dusk fell, Ney's corps arrived in pursuit of the Prussians and took Schlodeten. This new threat forced Bennigsen to call off his attack on Davout. And as darkness descended, the day's slaughter finally came to an end. No matter where one looked, one saw nothing but corpses, and beheld men dragging themselves over the ground. One heard nothing but heart-rendering cries that went away, horror-struck Jean-Baptiste Barré. Since Napoleon had crowned himself emperor in 1804, 
Every campaign, every battle he'd waged had ended in brilliant success. No longer. Bennigsen, learning the true scale of his army's losses and its critical shortage of ammunition, withdrew overnight. Uh, Bennigsen's retreat was very orderly, and he it is evidenced by the fact that he only lost 1% of his cannons. <laughs> so he managed to bring most of everyone with him, except the wounded, of course. And, uh, yeah. It is a very devastating battlefield that Benningsen left behind him. The French were left holding a frozen, corpse-strewn battlefield, allowing Napoleon to claim a victory. But in reality, Eilau had been a murderous slaughter, without a winner. As Marshal Ney exclaimed on seeing the battlefield, what a massacre, and without result. Exact casualty figures are unknown due to the chaos and conditions of the battle and the scale of loss. But it is likely that the Russians lost 20,000 men, killed, wounded or captured. The French, perhaps as many as 25,000. And that makes sense, considering Augereau's disaster and the fact that the French were the ones attacking, they ought to have higher casualty numbers than the Russians. Um, but still, these sort of casualty numbers were very unusual at the time. This was a significant percentage of both armies. And as we will see, like if we compare to the Battle of Fleurus, uh, during the Revolutionary Wars, the casualty rate was 6%. If we look at the Battle of Waterloo, um, 20 years later, the casualty uh, percentage is 45%. And this um, is a trend, like I said before, where the um, increasing amount of artillery and the increasing amount of men on the battlefield will result in a higher and higher and higher percentage as the war goes on. And it's uh, really frightening how many men could lose their lives during a two-day engagement. And uh, this is really, when you think about it, the first signs of the industrial warfare that is to come during the 20th century, where the casualty numbers will become even more outrageous. What is clear is that thousands of French veterans, the victors of Ulm, Austerlitz and Jena, met their end on the snowy fields of East Prussia. Napoleon's Grande Armée would go on to achieve many more great victories, including a crushing victory over Bennigsen's Russians at Friedland four months later. But, after the brutal losses of Eilau, it was never the same. Th yeah, uh, that is true. The increasing amount of casualties will mean that Napoleon will have less and less and less veterans for the upcoming campaigns. And will, it will really start to affect uh, Napoleon's battlefield performances. And uh, he will make do with his conscripts up until 1812, really. But in 1813, the lack of veterans uh, in the form of experienced officers and non-commissioned officers really starts to show. And the Allies... Uh, will be able to exploit that to full advantage. But uh, we have already covered those campaigns and battles, and so we have reached the end of the Battle of Eilau. Now we will be continuing on with the Marshall series or the Napoleon in Italy series. One of those two, I'm not sure which one to begin with. Uh, you guys can 
leave your preferences down below. But if you enjoyed the video, uh, please leave a like and uh, subscribe for more. And I'll see you guys uh, next time.